Welcome to Frig Friday, featuring Sigrid Unset's Kristen Lovren's Daughter, read by Michelle Hammond, sponsored by Gal's Guide. Kristen Lovren's Daughter by Sigrid Unset Winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature Book One The Wreath Part One Jorengard Chapter Five In the springtime of Kristen's fifteenth year, Lovrens Bjorgelfsen and Sir Andres Goodmanson of Diefren agreed to meet at Hollandis Thing. There they decided that Andres' second son, Simon, should be betrothed to Kristen Lovren's daughter, and that he would be given Formo, the property which Andres had inherited from his mother. The men sealed the agreement with a handshake, but no document was drawn up about it because Andres first had to arrange for the inheritance of his other children, and no betrothal ale was drunk either. But Sir Andres and Simon accompanied Lovren's back to Jorengard to see the bride, and Lovrens gave a great banquet. Lovrens had finished building the new house, two stories tall, with brick fireplaces in both the main room and the loft. It was richly and beautifully decorated with wood carvings and fine furniture. He had also renovated the old loft and expanded the other buildings, so that he could now live in a manner befitting a squire. By this time he possessed great wealth, for he had been fortunate in his undertakings, and he was a wise and thoughtful master. He was especially known for breeding the finest horses and the best cattle of all types, and now that he had arranged things so that his daughter would acquire Formo through marriage with a man of the Defren lineage, people said that he had successfully achieved his goal of becoming the foremost landowner in the village. Lovrens and Ronfred were also very pleased, as were Sir Andres and Simon. Kristen was a little disappointed when she first saw Simon Andresen, for she had heard such high praise of his handsome appearance and noble manner that there was no limit to what she had expected of her bridegroom. Simon was indeed handsome, but he was rather heavy-set for a man of only twenty. He had a short neck, and his face was as round and shiny as the moon. His hair was quite beautiful, brown and curly, and his eyes were gray and clear but they seemed slightly pinched because his eyelids were puffy. His nose was too small, and his mouth was also small and pouting, but not ugly. And in spite of his stoutness, he was light-footed and quick and agile in all his movements, and he was an able sportsman. He was rather impetuous and rash in his speech, but Lovrens felt that he nevertheless showed good sense and wisdom when he spoke to older men. Ronfred soon came to like him, and Ulfhild developed at once the greatest affection for him. He was also particularly kind and loving toward the little maiden who was ill, and after Kristen had grown accustomed to his round face and his way of speaking, she was entirely satisfied with her betrothed and pleased that her father had arranged the marriage for her. Fru Asild was invited to the banquet. Ever since the people of Jorendgard had taken up with her, the gentry of the nearest villages had once again begun to remember her high birth, and they paid less attention to her strange reputation, so now Fru Asild was often in the company of others. After she had seen Simon, she said, He's a good match, Kristen. This Simon will do well in the world. You'll be spared many types of sorrow, and he'll be a kind man to live with. But he seems to me rather too fat and cheerful. If things were the same in Norway today as they were in the past and as they are in other countries, where people are no sterner towards sinners than God is himself, then I would suggest you find yourself a friend who is thin and melancholy, someone you could sit and talk to. Then I would say that you could fare no better than with Simon. Kristen blushed, even though she didn't fully understand what Fru Asild meant. But as time passed and her dowry chests were filled, and she listened to the constant talk of her marriage and what she could take to her new home, she began to yearn for the matter to be bound with a formal betrothal and for Simon to come north. After a while she began to think about him a great deal, and she looked forward to seeing him again. Kristen was now grown up, and she was exceedingly beautiful. She most resembled her father. She was tall and small-waisted, with slender, elegant limbs, but she was also buxom and shapely. 
Her face was rather short and round, her forehead low and broad and white as milk, her eyes large, gray, and gentle under finely etched brows. Her mouth was a little too big, but her full lips were a fresh red, and her chin was round like an apple and nicely shaped. She had lovely, thick, long hair, but it was rather dark now, more brown than gold, and quite straight. Lovrens liked nothing better than to hear Sarah Eirik boast about Kristen. The priest had watched the maiden grow up and taught her reading and writing and was very fond of her. But Lovrens was not particularly pleased to hear the priest occasionally compare his daughter to a flawless and glossy-coated young mare. Yet everyone said that if the accident had not befallen Ulfield, she would have been many times more beautiful than her sister. She had the prettiest and sweetest face, white and pink like roses and lilies, with white gold silky soft hair that flowed and curled around her slender neck and thin shoulders. Her eyes resembled those of the Yaisling family. They were deep set beneath straight black brows, and they were as clear as water and grayish blue, but her gaze was gentle, not sharp. The child's voice was also so clear and lovely that it was a joy to listen to her whether she spoke or sang. She had an agile talent for book learning and for playing all types of stringed instruments and board games, but she took little interest in needlework because her back would quickly tire. It seemed unlikely that this pretty child would ever regain the full health of her body, although she improved somewhat after her parents took her to Nidaros, to the shrine of St. Olaf. Lavrens and Ronfrid went there on foot, without a single servant or maid to accompany them, and they carried the child on a litter between them for the entire journey. After that, Ulfield was so much better that she could walk without crutch. But it was not likely that she would ever be well enough to marry, and so, when the time came, she would probably be sent to a convent with all the possessions that she would inherit. They never talked about it, and Ulfield was not aware that she was any different from other children. She was very fond of finery and beautiful clothes, and her parents didn't have the heart to refuse her anything. Ronfred stitched and sewed for her and adorned her like a royal child. Once some peddlers came through the village and stayed the night at Laugerbrew, where Ulfield was allowed to examine their wares. They had some amber-yellow silk, and she was set on having a shift made from it. Lovrens normally never traded with the kind of people who traveled through villages, illegally selling goods from the town, but this time he bought the entire bolt at once. He also gave Kristen cloth for her bridal shift, which she worked on during the summer. Before that, she had never owned shifts made of anything but wool, except for a linen shift for her finest gown. But Ulfield was given a shift made of silk to wear to banquets, and a Sunday shift of linen with a bodice of silk. Lovrens Bjorgelsen now owned Laugerbrew as well, which was tended by Tortoise and Jan. Lovrens and Ronfred's youngest daughter, Romborg, lived with them there. Tortoise had been her wet nurse. Ronfred would hardly even look at the child during the first days after her birth because she said that she brought her children bad luck. And yet she loved the little maiden dearly and was constantly sending gifts to her and to Tortoise. Later on, she would often go over to Laugerbrew to visit Romborg, but she preferred to arrive after the child was asleep, and then she would sit with her. Lovrens and the two older daughters often went to Laugerbrew to play with the little one. She was a strong and healthy child, though not as pretty as her sisters. That summer was the last one that Arna Geardson spent at Jorengard. The bishop had promised Geard to help the boy make his way in the world, and in the fall Arna was to leave for Hamar. Kristen had undoubtedly noticed that Arna was fond of her, but in many ways her feelings were quite childish, so she didn't give it much thought and behaved toward him as she always had ever since they were children. She sought out his company as often as she could and always took his hand when they danced at home or on the church hill. The fact that her mother didn't approve of this she found rather amusing, but she never spoke to Arna about Simon or about her betrothal for she noticed that he grew dispirited whenever it was mentioned. Arna was good with his hands, and he wanted to make Kristen a sewing chest to remember him by. He had carved an elegant and beautiful box and frame, and now he was working in the smithy to make iron bands and a lock for it. On a fine evening with fair weather late in the summer, Kristen went over to talk to him. She took along one of her father's shirts to mend, 
sat down on the stone doorstep and began to sew as she chatted with the young man inside the smithy. Ulfield was with her too, hopping around on her crutch and eating raspberries that were growing among the stones piled up on the ground. After a while, Arna came over to the smithy door to cool off. He wanted to sit down next to Kristen, but she moved away a bit and asked him to take care not to get soot on the sewing that she was holding on her lap. So that's how things have become between us, said Arna. You don't dare let me sit with you because you're afraid that the farm boy will get you dirty? Kristen looked at him in surprise and then said, You know quite well what I meant. But take off your apron, wash the coal from your hands, and sit down here with me and rest a while. And she made room for him. But Arna lay down in the grass in front of her. Then Kristen continued, Now don't be angry, dear Arna. Do you think I would be so ungrateful for the lovely present that you're making for me, or that I would ever forget that you've always been my best friend here at home? Have I been? he asked. You know you have, said Kristen, and I'll never forget you. But you, who are about to go out into the world, maybe you'll acquire wealth and honor before you know it. You'll probably forget me long before I forget you. You'll never forget me, said Arna, and smiled. But I'll forget you before you forget me. You're such a child, Kristen. You're not very old yourself, she replied. I'm just as old as Simondara, he said. And we can bear helmets and shields just as well as the Dieffren people. But my parents have not had fortune on their side. He had wiped off his hands on some tufts of grass. Now he took hold of Kristen's ankle and pressed his cheek against her foot, which was sticking out from the hem of her dress. She tried to pull her foot away, but Arna said, Your mother is at Laugerbrew, and Lovren's rode off from the farm, and from the buildings no one can see us sitting here. Just this once you must let me talk about what's on my mind. Kristen replied, We've always known, both you and I, that it would be futile for us to fall in love with each other. Can I put my head in your lap? asked Arna and when she didn't reply, he did it anyway, wrapping his arm around her waist. With the other hand, he tugged on her braids. How will you like it, he asked after a moment, when Simon lies in your lap like this and plays with your hair? Kristen didn't answer. She felt as if a weight suddenly fell upon her. Arna's words and Arna's head on her knees. It seemed to her as if a door were opening into a room with many dark corridors leading into more darkness. Unhappy and heartsick, she hesitated, refusing to look inside. Married people don't do things like this, she said abruptly and briskly, as if with relief. She tried to imagine Simon's plump, round face looking up at her with the same gaze in his eyes as Arna now had. She heard his voice, and she couldn't help laughing. I don't think Simon would ever lie down on the ground to play with my shoes. No because he can play with you in his own bed, said Arna. His voice made Kristen feel suddenly sick and helpless. She tried to push his head off her lap, but he pressed it harder against her knees and said gently, But I would play with your shoes and your hair and your fingers and follow you in and out all day long, Kristen, if you would be my wife and sleep in my arms every night. He pulled himself halfway up, put his hands on her shoulders, and looked into her eyes. It's not proper for you to talk to me this way, said Kristen, quietly and shyly. No, it's not, said Arna. He got to his feet and stood in front of her. But tell me one thing. Wouldn't you rather it had been me? Oh, I would rather. She sat in silence for a moment. I would rather not have any man at all, not even... Arna didn't move. He said... Would you rather go into a convent, then, as they've planned for Ulfhild, and be a maiden all your days? Kristen wrung her hands in her lap. She felt a strange, sweet trembling inside her, and with a sudden shudder she realized how sad it was for her little sister, and her eyes filled with tears of sorrow for Ulfhild's sake. Kristen, said Arna gently. At that moment Ulfhild screamed loudly. Her crutch had lodged between some stones, and she had fallen. Arna and Kristen ran over to her, and Arna lifted her into her sister's arms. She had cut her mouth and was bleeding badly. Kristen sat down with her in the doorway to the smithy, and Arna brought water in a wooden bowl. Together they began to wash Ulfield's face. She had also scraped the skin on her knees. Kristen bent tenderly over the small, thin legs. 
Ulfield's wailing soon stopped, and she whimpered softly, the way children do who are used to suffering pain. Kristen pressed Ulfield's head against her breast and rocked her gently. Then the bell up in Olaf's church began ringing for vespers. Arna spoke to Kristen, but she sat there as if she neither heard nor sensed what he said as she bent over her sister. Then he grew frightened and asked her whether she thought the injuries were serious. Kristen shook her head, but refused to look at him. A little later, she stood up and started walking toward the farm, carrying Ulfield in her arms. Arna followed, silent and confused. Kristen looked so preoccupied that her face was completely rigid. As she walked, the bell continued to toll across the meadows and valley. It was still ringing as she went into the house. She placed Ulfield on the bed which the sisters had shared ever since Kristen had grown too old to sleep with her parents. Then she took off her own shoes and lay down next to the little one. She lay there and listened for the bell long after it had stopped ringing and the child was asleep. It had occurred to her, as the bell began to peal, while she sat with Ulfield's little bloodied face in her hands, that perhaps this was an omen for her. If she would take her sister's place, if she would promise herself to the service of God and the Virgin Mary, then maybe God would grant the child renewed vigor and good health. Kristen remembered Brother Edvin saying that these days parents offered to God only the crippled and lame children or those for whom they could not arrange good marriages. She knew her parents were pious people, and yet she had never heard them say anything except that she would marry. But when they realized that Ulfhild would be ill all her days, they at once proposed that she should enter a convent. But Kristen didn't want to do it. She resisted the idea that God would perform a miracle for Ulfhild if she became a nun. She clung to Sarah Eirich's words that so few miracles occurred nowadays, and yet she had the feeling this evening that it was as Brother Edvin had said, that if someone had enough faith, then he could indeed work miracles. But she did not want that kind of faith. She did not love God and his mother and the saints in that way. She would never love them in that way. She loved the world and longed for the world. Kristen pressed her lips to Ulfield's soft, silky hair. The child slept soundly, but the elder sister sat up, restless, and then lay down again. Her heart was bleeding with sorrow and shame, but she knew that she could not believe in miracles because she was unwilling to give up her inheritance of health and beauty and love. Then she tried to console herself with the thought that her parents would never give her permission to do such a thing, nor would they ever believe that it would do any good. She was already betrothed, after all and they would undoubtedly be loath to lose Simon, who they liked so much. She felt betrayed because they seemed to find this son-in-law so splendid. She suddenly thought with displeasure of Simon's round, red face and his small, laughing eyes, of his leaping gait. It occurred to her all of a sudden that he bounced like a ball, and of his teasing manner of speaking, which made her feel awkward and stupid. And it was not such a splendid thing either to be given to him and then move only as far as Formo. And yet she would rather have him than be sent to a convent. But what about the world beyond the mountains, the king's castle, and the counts and the knights that Fru Oshield had talked about? A handsome man with melancholy eyes who would follow her in and out and never grow tired. She remembered Arna on that summer day long ago when he lay on his side and slept with his shiny brown hair spread out on the heath. She had loved him as if he were her own brother back then. It wasn't proper for him to speak to her the way he had today, when he knew they could never have each other. Word was sent from Laugerbrew that her mother would stay there overnight. Kristen got up to undress and get ready for bed. She began to unlace her dress, but then she put her shoes back on, wrapped her cloak around her, and went out. The night sky, bright and green, stretched above the mountain crests. It was almost time for the moon to rise, and at the spot where it waited below the ridge, small clouds drifted past, gleaming like silver underneath. The sky grew lighter and lighter, like metal gathering dew. Kristen ran between the fences, across the road, and up the hill toward the church. It was asleep, black and locked. 
but she went over to the cross that stood nearby, a memorial to the time when St. Olav once rested there as he was fleeing from his enemies. Kristen knelt down on the stone and placed her folded hands on the base. Holy cross, the strongest of masts, the fairest of trees, the bridge for those who are ill to the fair shores of health. As she spoke the words of the prayer, she felt her yearning gradually spread like rings on water. The various thoughts that were making her uneasy were smoothed out. Her mind grew calmer, more tender, and a gentle sorrow, empty of all thought, replaced her troubles. She stayed there on her knees, aware of all the sounds of the night. The wind was sighing so oddly. The river was roaring beyond the groves on the other side of the church, and the stream was flowing nearby, right across the road. And everywhere, both close at hand and far away in the dark, her eyes and her ears caught hints of tiny rivulets of running and dripping water. The river flashed white down in the village. The moon glided up over a small gap in the mountains. Stones and leaves wet with dew shimmered faintly, and the newly tarred timbers of the bell tower near the cemetery gate shone dull and dark. Then the moon vanished again where the ridge of the mountain rose higher. Many more gleaming white clouds appeared in the sky. She heard a horse approaching at a slow pace higher up the road, and the sound of men's voices, speaking evenly and softly. Kristen was not afraid of people so close to home where she knew everyone. She felt quite safe. Her father's dogs came rushing toward her, turned around and bounded back to the grove, then turned again and raced back to her. Then her father called a greeting as he emerged from among the birches. He was leading Goldsvine by the bridle. A bunch of birds dangled in front of the saddle, and Lavrens was carrying a hooded hawk on his left hand. He was in the company of a tall, hunched-back man in monk's clothing, and before Kristen had even seen his face, she knew it was Brother Edvin. She went to greet them, and she couldn't have been more surprised than if she had dreamed it. She merely smiled when Lavrens asked her whether she recognized their guest. Lavrens had met the monk up by Rost Bridge. Then he had persuaded him to come home with him and stay the night at the farm. But Brother Edvin insisted on being allowed to sleep in the cowshed. For I've picked up so many lice that you can't have me lying in your good beds. And no matter how much Lavrens begged and implored, the monk was adamant. At first, he even wanted them to bring his food into the courtyard. But finally they coaxed him inside the house, and Kristen put wood in the fireplace in the corner and set candles on the table while a maid brought in food and drink. The monk sat down on the beggar's bench near the door, but he would only take cold porridge and water for his evening meal, and he refused to accept Lavrens' offer to prepare a bath for him and to have his clothes washed. Brother Edvin scratched and rubbed himself, and his gaunt old face beamed with glee. No, no, he said. The lice bite better at my proud hide than any scourges or the guardian's words. I spent this summer under an overhang up on the mountain. They had given me permission to go into the wilderness to fast and pray, and there I sat, thinking that I was as pure as a holy hermit and the poor people over in Setna Valley brought food up to me, and thought they beheld a pious monk living a pure life. Brother Edvin, they said, if there were more monks like you, then we would soon mend our ways. But when we see priests and bishops and monks shoving and fighting like piglets at the trough, well, I told them that was not a Christian way to talk, but I liked hearing it all the same, and I sang and prayed so my voice resounded in the mountains. Now it will be to my benefit to feel how the lice are biting and fighting on my skin, and to hear the good housewives who want to keep their houses clean and neat shouting that the filthy monk hide can just as well sleep in the barn during the summer. I'm heading north to Nidaros now to celebrate St. Olaf's Day, and it will do me good to see that people aren't so keen to come near me. Ulfield woke up. Then Lavrens went over and lifted her up in his cape. Here is the child I told you about, dear father. Place your hands on her and pray to God for her, the way you prayed for the boy up north in Meldal. We heard he regained his health. The monk gently put his hand under Ulvild's chin and looked into her eyes. Then he lifted one of her hands and kissed it. You should pray instead, 
you and your wife, Lovrens Bjorgelsen, that you will not be tempted to bend God's will with this child. Our Lord Jesus himself has set these small feet on a path so that she can walk safely toward the house of peace. I can see it in your eyes, blessed Ulfhild, that you have your intercessors in that other house. I heard that the boy in Meldal got well, said Lovrens quietly. He was the only child of a poor widow, and there was no one to feed or clothe him when the mother passed away, except the village, and yet the woman only asked that God give her a fearless heart, so that she might have faith that he would let happen whatever was best for the boy. I did nothing more than pray alongside her. It's not easy for Ronfred and me to be content with that, said Lovrens gloomily, especially since she's so pretty and so good. Have you seen the child they have over in Lidstad, in the south of the valley? asked the monk. Would you rather your daughter were like that? Lovren shuddered and pressed the child close. Don't you think, Brother Edvin went on, that in God's eyes we are all like children for whom he has reason to grieve, crippled as we are by sin? And yet we don't think that things are the worst in the world for us. He walked over to the painting of the Virgin Mary on the wall, and everyone knelt down as he said the evening prayer. They felt that Brother Edvin had offered them great comfort. But after he had left the house to find his sleeping place, Astrid, who was in charge of all the maids, vigorously swept the floor everywhere the monk had stood and hastily threw the sweepings into the fire. The next morning, Kristen got up early put some milk porridge and wheat cakes into a lovely red-flecked bowl made from birch roots, for she knew that the monk never touched meat, and took the food out to him. No one else in the house was awake yet. Brother Edvin was standing on the ramp to the cowshed, ready to leave with his staff and bag in hand. With a smile, he thanked Kristen for her trouble and sat down in the grass and ate while Kristen sat at his feet. Her little white dog came running over to them, making the tiny bells on his collar ring. Kristen pulled the dog onto her lap, and Brother Edvin snapped his fingers, tossing little bits of wheat cake into the dog's mouth as he praised the animal. It's the same breed that Queen Euphemia brought over to Norway, he said. Everything is so splendid here at Jorengard now. Kristen blushed with pleasure. She knew the dog was particularly fine, and she was proud to own him. No one else in the village had a pet dog, but she hadn't known that he was of the same type as the queen's pet dogs. Simon Andresen sent him to me, she said, hugging the dog as he licked her face. His name is Cordelin. She had planned to speak to the monk about her uneasiness and ask for his advice, but now she had no wish to spend any more time on her thoughts of the night before. Brother Edvin believed that God would do what was best for Ulfield. And it was generous of Simon to send her such a gift even before their betrothal had been formally acknowledged. She refused to think about Arna. He had behaved badly toward her, she thought. Brother Edvin picked up his staff and bag and asked Kristen to give his greetings to the others. He wouldn't wait for everyone to wake up, but would set off while the day was cool. She walked with him up past the church and a short way into the grove. When they parted, he offered her God's peace and blessed her. Give me a few words, as you did for Ulfhild, dear father, begged Kristen as she stood with her hand in his. The monk poked his bare foot, naughty with rheumatism, in the wet grass. Then I would impress upon your heart, my daughter, that you should pay close attention to the way God tends to the welfare of the people here in the valley. Little rain falls, but he has given you water from the mountains, and the dew refreshes the meadows and fields each night. Thank God for the good gifts he has given you, and don't complain if you think you are lacking something else that you think would be beneficial. You have beautiful golden hair, so do not fret because it isn't curly. Haven't you heard about the woman who sat and wept because she had only a little scrap of pork to give to her seven hungry children for Christmas dinner? St. Olaf came riding past at that very moment. Then he stretched out his hand over the meat and prayed to God to feed the poor urchins. But when the woman saw that a slaughtered pig lay on the table, she began to cry because she didn't have enough bowls and pots. Kristen ran off toward home 
and Cordelin danced around her feet as he nipped at her clothing and barked, making all his tiny silver bells ring. 